Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Pineland Speaker Series. Uh, we've got some nice weather the next couple days, so if you get a chance, it's a great time to get out and about in the Pinelands. Uh, today, we're very lucky to have uh, Inga Lapuma with us. She's a, a specialist who uh, we've worked with in the commission in the past. Her specialty is uh, fire and fire habitat, fire management, and she's going to talk about uh, land fire and really give us some insight into some of the new tools and the technologies that are out there today to better um, prepare and plan for you know, the fire ecology of the Pinelands and other places as well. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over. Good morning. Good morning, thanks Joel. Thanks for inviting me to speak and welcome everybody. Um, so just a little bit of background um, on, on me as I did start out um, with fire in New Jersey and mapping the fire history. So. Um, a lot of you probably have seen some of that um, work that I've done and also um, some landscape level uh, disturbance and succession modeling, looking at land use change and climate change um, and how that affects succession and fire in New Jersey. Um, so that was kind of my PhD level work at Rutgers uh, Center for Remote Sensing and Spatial Analysis. And then I moved on to work with um, the North Atlantic Fire Science Exchange. So kind of expanded my region a little bit to the Northeast um, and working as a science communications director for that organization. Um, and then about a year ago, I moved, um, moved on to land fire. And um, now I have my hands all over the place. So land fire is a national level program. And um, one, one cool thing is that uh, I'm learning a little bit about everything. So I have my hands in everything um, now in terms of vegetation and fire mapping across the United States. Um, I'm also on sort of my local crew for the New Jersey Forest Fire Service. And so I've, um, I'm able to get out and um, work on prescribed fires now and then, which is great to kind of ground myself in what managers are actually dealing with. So. First, I'm going to give you a little overview of land fire and some of the um, spatial data that we provide. Um, and those fall into you know, four major categories. We have vegetation, disturbance, fuels, um, and fire regime. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about the applications of land fire and what you can use it for. Uh, for example, wildland fire risk assessments, um, how the fuel models play into that. Um, some of our plans for the future and potential innovations that we might be looking at. So a little bit of background on land fire in general. So it's a joint effort between the Department of Interior and the Forest Service. Um, we have lots of partners, TNC, major partner, um, USGS is, is running the um, production of um, land fire and a lot of, uh, and we have contractors to the USGS that do a lot of the production and, and I'm one of those contractors. Um, and so land fire, it's, it's really was focused on sort of an all lands approach. Um, so we cover the continental United States, Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, all the insular areas, territories. Um, so, you know, I learned a lot about <laughs> American Samoa, for example, in the last year. So it was really, really a uh, comprehensive uh, data set. But we focus not only on fire, so um, I, I want to um, stress that we do uh, focus on land. So the vegetation classifications across um, every 30 meters of the United States, um, we look at disturbance and how those, how those fit together and how they influence some of the fire behavior as well. So we have a lot of resources there. Um, land fire started in about 2004, um, and so we've been around for a while. We had sort of a, a major first effort of mapping uh, early on, and then recently we've had a major, uh, we had many updates in between, um, and then recently we've had our remap, which is sort of a comprehensive redoing of all of our, our base maps. So we have a lot of data. We have about 31 spatial, uh, you know, oriented layers. Um, and you can see they fall under these different categories. So uh, existing vegetation cover, height, types. And we have two different types of uh, 
uh, vegetation classifications. Um, we have disturbance, we have annual disturbance, we have a historic disturbance, um, which is like combined 10 years. Um, we have fire regime, so your mean fire return interval um, and all of those different fire aspects. We have fuels and all of these fuels, the surface, surface fuel models that, that drive fire behavior models. Um, we have comprehensive topographic layers. So if you ever need elevation and height, you know, and, and slope and aspect um, across uh, the United States. And then we also have a lot of reference data. So this is what we use to actually drive a lot of our modeling. So first thing for vegetation mapping. So we kind of start with plot data. Um, and, and the reason we do that is because uh, that's, that's real information on the ground, right? So we have about a million plots in our um, reference database. And you can see here, this the purple here is showing um, the, uh, the remap plots that we added from the initial um, mapping. So first the field plots, they go through a, a keying out pro process. So there are species um, listed in the plots and also cover. And so if they have that information, then um, it goes through an auto key process and, and it'll assign, assign that plot to a vegetation class based on the species and the cover in, in that plot. So that's the first thing, but we have to fill in the blank spots in between all these plots, right? Somehow in order to get a comprehensive um, spatial data layer. So to do that, um, we have to model the, um, the, the pixels in between. And so we work on this pixel basis. And so this is like 30 by 30 meter square. And you can see here um, the, you know, this, these are examples of, of pixels here. So um, we need to be able to model the vegetation in between the plots. So for example, if there is a plot right here on the edge and it, um, and, and it overlaid some imagery from, land, uh, from, from Landsat, we could say, okay, well, it has a certain amount of greenness there. It has a certain amount of um, reflectance. And, and we can say those, those plots there, they have all of these layers underneath that, it, that are related to it. So things like um, the spring reflectance, the summer reflectance, the fall, and, and things like precipitation, average precipitation for that very location. And so we can relate that plot that we labeled based on the species and the cover to all of that information underneath it, okay? Now, if all that information is similar to a location with a plot, then uh, we can go over here and we can say, hey, these are all similar uh, to that plot location. We're gonna assign it that plot's vegetation type. And so that's the kind of model that we use to sort of fill in the gaps in between those plots. And it's a decision tree model and um, it's, a, it's very common in, in mapping vegetation. So here is an example of um, our ecological systems classification. And the, that vegetation classification has 856 classes across the United States. Um, if you look at New Jersey, it has 112. And then if you, if, if you go, sorry, if you go down to the um, Pinelands National Reserve, which is this blue outline, you um, get to about 75 different ecological systems. And I'll describe those a little bit more um, in a minute. Uh, but we also have what's called the National Vegetation Classification. And that's a little bit newer. It's a little less, um, it has a, a, a little fewer classes, um, but it's something that federal agencies are trying to kind of move towards as a standard. So how do our ecological system classes uh, compare to something that we're used to in New Jersey, which is sort of that land use land cover um, that the state provides. And here you can see um, the land use land cover on the, on the left, which has 83 classes in the Pinelands compared to our 75 classes. Um, although it looks like land fire has fewer classes, keep in mind that the land use land cover includes a percentage of cover in those classes. Whereas we keep our 
percent cover for vegetation in our height as separate layers. Um, but they're a little more detailed. And so when you combine the ecological systems layer with our vegetation cover and our vegetation height, it ends up being pretty detailed. And you can really narrow down on those areas um, that you're interested in, in terms of habitat assessments and fire. So here's an example of um, some of the differences between the land use land cover that we're used to here in New Jersey and land fire. And um, one thing you'll notice is that uh, we, we do have more vegetation classes in, in the tree um, category. And um, we have, uh, but we have fewer urban classes. Um, and then you can also see here that, um, you know, the land use land cover, as I said, it includes this percent cover for the different vegetation. Whereas again, ours is separate and I'll show you that in a minute. But the major, um, some of the major classes that we have here in, in the Pinelands are um, the North Atlantic Coastal Pitch Pine Barrens and the Lowlands. And if I go back one, you can see um, that this is the um, Barrens and then this uh, lighter blue is the Lowlands for Pitch Pine. So those are our ma two major classes. Okay, so for vegetation cover, we have information at 1% intervals, so from 0 to 100% cover for each, for, each, um, for each pixel, 30 by 30 meters on the landscape. And um, for that, we use um, LIDAR, which is light detection and ranging. And it's, a, it's another sensor that actually is, um, you know, the airplanes fly over and they shoot down light and whatever reflects off of the, the leaves and, and the branches, um, is a measurement. And so it ends up being like a point cloud of, of measurements for, um, for a tree, for example. So, so it's a lot of data. And so we end up sampling that LIDAR um, for cover and for height um, in order to kind of represent more plots in our, in our um, models to extrapolate across the landscape. So that comes in herb, shrub, and forest life forms. And so that's um, based on the dominant life form at that pixel. So as we move in, we can, can really kind of see <clears throat> um, the detail of our uh, vegetation cover layer for, for the pinelands. And so if you look here, the um, the black outline is the dwarf pine plains. So those are, you know, our area of very short stature um, uh, pitch pine and, and scrub oak. And you can really see that um, it is kind of lower compared to the surrounding um, landscape. It's, or it has lower cover. You can also see a signature from the Warren Grove fire in 2007. This is nine years before remap. And you can see that there's still uh, lower percent cover of vegetation there. Um, and you can, you can also see those areas that um, didn't burn uh, in, that, in that Warren Grove fire, some of those tree streets that we have for our really um, intense fires here in, in the pitch pine. So those came out because of the fact that they have a higher reflectance, um, you know, for the green um, visible and uh, near infrared and red. Um, layers in, in our electromagnetic spectrum from the satellite imagery. So really cool that that's actually still um, visible in our uh, land fire vegetation cover. So here's another layer, our existing vegetation height, and that's in one meter increments. Um, so again, you can see um, that that could be very detailed. Um, across the landscape. And here's a, a, little, uh, a little zoom in. Again, you know, obviously the dwarf pine plains are shorter, um, but you can also see that in that area of the Warren Grove fire that, that that's still kind of a shorter area as well compared to the surrounding pitch pine, which has taller trees. <clears throat> All right, so uh, the next um, grouping of layers that I'm going to talk about is our disturbance layers. Um, obviously, disturbance is very important to looking at habitat and for um, 
changes in fuels for fire behavior. So we're, um, we have several major um, inputs into our disturbance layer. Um, and it's sort of like one of the ponderance of evidence, right? So we want to get information from as many sources as possible to say that, yes, indeed, there was disturbance at this location, okay? And so some of the things we use <clears throat> are the National Fire Program data, and that's what that MTS bark and ravage, those are those, are those sources. Um, we also have our own methods of remote sensing of uh, change on the landscape, so land, land use, land cover change on the landscape. Um, we also get events, what we call events. So these are submitted perimeters from agencies and states and organizations all over the country that tell us, hey, yep, we performed a prescribed fire here, and this is our perimeter, or we um, did some mechanical thinning here. Um, so we use that information to give us an idea of what type of disturbance happened um, at that location. So we have all different types of, um, of uh, ways to detect disturbance. <clears throat> And we kind of put it all together to say, you know, we have a priority of, of what we think um, is the most reliable in terms of our, our disturbance layers. So the first thing we look at is um, that National Fire Program data. And if you look up here, um, you can see, so this is our electromagnetic spectrum. So um, we have, you know, where green is highly reflective here for vegetation in the visible um, part of the spectrum. But then when you get to near infrared and shortwave infrared, our Landsat satellites, they pick up this in addition to the visible. And so you can see here that the, uh, if something is burned, if vegetation is burned, it's, it's not going to reflect nearly as much as healthy vegetation in the near infrared. And it's going to reflect a lot more in the shortwave infrared. So that's how we're able to pull out those areas that have burned, okay, with the satellite imagery. And so <clears throat> you can also get an estimate of the severity based on um, those differences. So MTBS is the Monitoring Trends and Burn Severity um, Program, and <clears throat> it's national in scope as well. And um, and they map fires every year, uh, but in the east, they're, the smallest fire that they, they map is 500 acres. So that kind of, you know, that puts a, a bit of a limit on um, what they detect for, for our region. The bark and the ravage programs, they're more of a like right after a fire. They're, they're um, typically for federal lands, so we don't have a lot of that data in the east either. <clears throat> But we have our own method of um, detecting change with imagery. And again, you know, this is, uh, this is called the MICA, the Multi-Indexed Integrated Change Analysis. So we use that, um, the normalized burn ratio. So that was kind of using this, this action here. So we use the normalized burn ratio. We use NDVI, which is, is a measure of greenness, um, and a couple other um, indices to help us understand what, what has changed on the landscape from one year to the next. So here's a, a, an example of our um, submitted perimeters across um, the last 10 years for disturbance. <clears throat> um, actually, this is for, <laughs> for 99 through 2016, but for REMAP, we use the last 10 years. Um, and you can see that um, there's a lot going on <laughs> in, in terms of submitted events. You can see that there's some differences between states in what we report. So this was an insect report, insect damage report in Pennsylvania. Um, obviously, it probably didn't stop at the border, um, but you know, it's just a difference in what, what was reported during that time period. You can also see that Division B has had a long history of mapping their perimeters, whereas uh, Division C in the South did more of a point-based and acreage um, kind of reporting in the past, although that has changed, right? So <laughs> Marie Cook has been very vigilant with the New Jersey, New Jersey Forest Fire Service in, in getting folks to, um, 
to map these perimeters. It's a lot easier with some of the technology we have now as well. Um, so these, these reports of prescribed fires will be incorporated into future versions of land fire. So that's going to be very helpful. Um, you know, I just I want to stress too for, for folks on the on the call that um, that land fire needs mechanical, <laughs> we need insect damage, you know, any kind of change to help us sort of decide, okay, well, this is the actual reason for this disturbance that we're detecting from remote sensing and satellite imagery. So another indices that we use is the burned area essential climate variable. Um, and so this, this helps us for some of our unknown um, disturbances that we pick up. Um, this help us, helps us assign, okay, actually, yes, this was burned. And so this is coming from um, the USGS as well. So when you put it all together, you get, um, you know, uh, this, this is our 10 year, uh, uh, historical disturbance layer. So you can see that, um, you know, that we picked up, we picked up a bunch of our wildfires that happened, um, but there's also these gray sort of unknown um, disturbances. And again, you know, those were just, they, there was nothing there that could co corroborate what that change was from. Most likely they are prescribed fires um, that, um, that just weren't picked up for whatever reason. You can also see that insect area up there in Pennsylvania. So this is the historical disturbance. It's 10 years of combined disturbance. Um, but if you look at the annual disturbance, we have every year uh, separated out. And you, you know, the, the actual um, information with the annual disturbance is, is quite detailed. So we have the year, the type, we have the confidence in what you know, the disturbance type is. Uh, we have the severity, um, the source of severity. We have the confidence in the severity that we've assigned. And so there's all different kinds of um, uh, layers of information there. But then if you look at the actual description, that gives you kind of the real detailed background of how we derive that disturbance at that particular location. Okay, so the next group of um, of layers that I'm going to talk about are our fuels layers. And these are really important for fire behavior models, things like fire, far sight that they use actually on the ground operationally in, um, in fires and to understand where the fire is going to go, who, you know, maybe who has to evacuate or, you know, some of the logistics involved in fighting fire. <clears throat> so that's where, where these fuels layers um, are, are really important. And so, um, Part of this is model, modeling crown fire. And crown fire is obviously the fire that's going you know, through the canopy. And, um, and so to model crown fire, we need estimates of canopy cover. And so that's pulling out just the tree cover um, from that existing vegetation cover um, layer that I showed you. The full information has the herbs and the shrubs, you know, but this is just the, the canopy um, values here. And if you look here, you can see that obviously the Pinelands has a lot of tree cover. Um, and, um, and, and those ranges, those are those ranges actually, the pixel value is actually the midpoint between those ranges. So that's Kind of they just sort of pick the midpoint to assign the pixel value. So the 10 to 20 percent, actually the pixel value there would be 15. So just kind of give you a little detail on that. And we also have canopy height, also very important for crown fire um, modeling. And again, this is um, going to show you the midpoint of that range. So 1.8 to 5 meters is going to be like around 3 meters for the actual pixel value. So um, other things that are important for modeling crown fire are the canopy base height. So this is essentially telling you, um, you know, what is the space between the surface fuels and the base of where um, the tree, you know, the, the base of the, of the canopy of the tree. And so people talk about ladder fuels, right? So that kind of gives you an idea of how likely is it for that surface fire, which is basically how fire spreads mainly, right? 
for how likely is it for that surface fire to get up into the canopy? And so if you have a lower canopy base height, then it's more likely that it's going to make it up into the crown of the trees. So, <clears throat> so that's an important one. Um, we do model that. So that's um, based on the forest vegetation simulator model. So it's a very common model in forestry um, with the fire and fuels extension. And um, we do that for each EVT. And then we relate that to our cover and height um, in order to extrapolate that um, across the landscape. But you can see it's actually in this uh, tenth of a meter um, um, you know, bins here. So it's pretty detailed. <clears throat> and I did sort of cut these <laughs> legends off because they're so big, um, just to give you an idea of the range here. <clears throat> Okay, and so the other thing that is important um, for um, fire behavior models is canopy bulk density. And so um, that is sort of a measurement of the amount and the arrangement of the aerial fuels. Um, so how dense is, is that vegetation um, and, and how much is, is there? Okay, so that, that um, gives you an idea of, of how much fuel is actually there. Okay, so I mentioned the surface fuel models and, and that fire is, you know, mainly spreads by the surface uh, fuels. And so these are really important models um, to feed into those uh, fire behavior models of fire spread. And so um, <clears throat> these uh, surface fuel models, they depend on the vegetation cover, the height, the fuel mo moisture, um, the, you know, <clears throat> the wind, and they give us an indication of um, how fast uh, fire will spread in those fuels. And, um, and also the intensity of the burning. So for example, the flame length. So, um, so for example, uh, most of the pinelands here, you can see this SH. So most of the pinelands is in the SH eight and nine um, fuel models. And those models are two of sort of the fastest spreading and, and most intense fuel models um, um, that are available. Um, and so it's similar to what's found in the Florida scrub shrub um, area. So they have some of the same models there. Um, but again, it's a, it's, it, it's a very unique ecosystem here, the pinelands, the, those fuels uh, you know, thing, fire spreads fast and it's pretty intense. Um, so we have two kind of classifications of fuel models. One is the Scott and Bergen and that has 40 different categories and that's what I'm showing you here. There's another one called the um, Anderson 13. So it has a fewer classes. Um, so those are very important for those fire behavior um, models. We also have fire regime products. And so, um, those include um, the vegetation that may have been dominant on the landscape uh, pre-European settlement. So based on, <clears throat> based on some of this um, historic information, you know, experts have gone through and said, okay, well, um, in this area, um, before there was a lot of sort of um, non-Native American human inter intervention, uh, this is how the ecosystem would change through time. So the succession of the ecosystem. And within that, there are estimates of the fire return interval, uh, how much low severity, medium and high severity fire occurred there. Um, and so here you can see, we have an, um, a map of what's called the vegetation departure. And so that's kind of a measurement of how different things are now compared to how they most likely were before pre-European settlement. And so you can see here <clears throat> that in the Pinelands, um, you know, we have, we're in the sort of 60% um, departure from pre-European um, types of vegetation that would have been there. So that, that can be a good um, layer to use if you're really trying to focus in on areas that you want to try to restore um, to, to pre-European uh, 
kind of, you know, situation with the, with the ecosystem. So um, you can kind of see in the south here, um, there's a little bit more red, right? So, you know, we have a great prescribed fire um, kind of in that Wharton forest area, but maybe not as much in that southern section historically. <clears throat> So uh, a little side note, <laughs> based on some of my past research, um, you know, look, the pre-European information is pretty sparse for New Jersey. Um, and that's due to sort of our intense land use, you know, how everything was sort of logged <laughs> several times. We don't have a lot of paleological information, for example, like charcoal to look at <clears throat> what the fire history was. Um, the tree cores are pretty uh, sparse um, because of some of that logging and also the, the thickness of the bark of the pitch pine. Um, and, and then we do have, you know, we have early settler stories talking about Native American burning. So we have some information. We also have the fire adaptation of the pitch pine itself, um, which if you're familiar, it's, it's a pretty, uh, you know, it's very difficult to kill pitch pine with fire. It re-sprouts, um, it has epicormic shoots, it has those serotonous cones that open with fire. So we know that the area obviously experienced fire um, for those ad adaptations to, um, to happen uh, pre-European. We just don't know exactly you know, what happened um, before Europeans arrived. Um, but, uh, you know, given the work that um, I have done and Marie Cook has done and Jeremy Weber has done over the, uh, and so many people, <laughs> Trevor, um, have done over um, the past 10, 15 years to compile the wildfire history um, of New Jersey, we do have kind of an idea of what's been happening over the last 100 years. And so, <clears throat> So depending on what you want to manage for, right? We have a lot more people in New Jersey now than pre-European. And so um, we have different spatial layers to inform um, that kind of ma management and what you're shooting for. Are you shooting for risk reduction? Um, are you shooting for you know, a certain type of habitat or a little bit of both, right? Okay, so <clears throat> now I'm going to talk about a little bit about the uh, applications of land fire and, and what that spatial data can be used for. And so one of the major things that has really been um, kind of pushed lately are these wildland fire risk assessments. This is an image from Joe Scott um, from Pyrologics. He's been a major force in, in getting these um, assessments done across the country. <clears throat> and what it involves uh, are, is the hazard of um, a fire, so the probability and intensity, and that's really where those landscape level uh, fire behavior models come in. So you're looking at, you know, what is the likelihood of a fire occur occurring at a certain pixel, okay? And then the, the risk assessment also includes sort of this other side where you're talking about, okay, well, you know, Given this probability and intensity, what is the vulnerability of our highly valued resources and assets um, to that hazard? So that's kind of talking about more of your consequence side um, of, of wildland fire. And so um, for land fire, we're really focused on this side. So our data is feeding into this hazard assessment side of a wildland fire risk assessment. So um, I'm trying to remember what year it was. It was three or four years ago. Um, we had um, <clears throat> the CPAW program, the Community Protection Against Wildfire, came out to Barnegat Township and, um, and was um, really focused on giving them an estimate of their um, wildland fire risk. So first, in order to do that, um, Eva Corral, from the uh, Rocky Mountain Research Station, she detailed the uh, landscape level hazard um, produced by the FSIM model. And so that's a fire landscape level fire behavior model. And what it does, it gives you an estimate of the burn probability, okay? And we talked about that as part of the wildland fire risk assessment, um, as well as the conditional flame length. And that is sort of a proxy for that intensity, right, part of 
of the risk assessment. And then you get, you basically multiply those two together and you get um, what's um, your probability of hazard um, across the landscape. And so when she first showed, um, first showed us this, we had a little workshop, we had some fire managers there, I was there, you know, we looked at this image on the right and we thought, well, that's kind of strange. Like the, you know, the wetlands areas have a higher um, hazard than, than the pinelands. And so, um, so we looked into it and we're like, what is, you know, what's going on here? Some of the flame lengths were just, didn't really seem to represent um, what the managers had seen in the field. Um, and um, there was no canopy uh, crown fire at all um, in, in the model. And so that really suppressed the final hazard uh, ratings in, in, in this model. So we're like, what's going on here? Um, and so what we found out was that the, um, Eva used the, the 2014 canopy cover layer here. And what we found out was that um, for, um, for the reasons uh, related to the fuel model that was assigned there, which was a shrub fuel model, um, there was no canopy cover layer. And so, um, so you can see here, it actually says, you know, for much of uh, that 2014 canopy uh, cover layer uh, said non-forested. And so I was like, that's weird. And so I actually went to um, Megan Sabaski, who was the Eastern Land Fire Coordinator at the time, and, and she went to Henry Bastion, who's one of our business leaders, and we're like trying to figure this out, and, and Henry and, and um, everyone came back and said, well, actually, there is, you know, there is data there for trees um, in our vegetation layers, but it didn't transfer over to the fuels layer because of the fact that it was assigned a shrub fuel model, and typically shrub, shrub fuel models assume no canopy, okay? And so that's kind of just how they have, um, how they have evolved. Um, but it, it really was kind of causing these problems in the wildland fire risk assessment. Um, so Eva was able to, in CPAW, she was able to sort of add the canopy back in using this, um, you know, this layer from our 2014 data. The concern with adding canopy back in was that it would actually suppress the rate of spread in the fire behavior fuel models. Um, and so then it was like, well, what's more important, um, you know, the rate of spread, how fast the fire spreads or the flame length uh, and given, you know, the intensity of the fire. And so we went back, the fuels team went back and modeled some of our fires to try to see whether if we add canopy um, back into these fuel models, if it would really slow the fire down way too much, um, or if it would still be representative of, um, of what was happening and give us the flame lengths that we needed um, for these wildland fire risk assessments. So, <clears throat> so our fuel team, they, they used a fire site and they actually, uh, the Spring Hill fire from 2019, which was, I guess, about 12,000 acres. Um, and it was mostly in that dwarf pitch pine uh, ecosystem, so very short stature. Um, and we looked at the, uh, you know, we compared that shrub, um, shrub nine uh, fuel model um, with no canopy and with canopy. And you can see here, when you add canopy in, you get some seriously high flame lengths, okay? It's like 80, foot plus, and we weren't quite sure. So this one was kind of like, well, maybe it's not quite that high, um, but, um, you know, and then, and it did have like up to 40 feet um, without the canopy. So in the dwarf area, we were like, well, maybe that, you know, maybe we should leave the canopy out of that area. But when we went <clears throat> to some of the higher trees, so with sort of an average of 18 meters in the Penn Swamp Fire, from 2017, um, you know, obviously is very, you know, much, much taller than the dwarf pine plains. Um, and, and it looked like, yeah, okay, we could maintain our rate of spread and have much higher flame lengths with this um, scenario. So we did keep the canopy in um, those areas outside of the dwarf pine plains. 
because it seemed to not affect the rate of spread enough to, to actually um, to worry about. So, so we still have a good rate of spread in those areas outside of the dwarf pine plains with canopy. So the flame lengths are much higher. So here you can see, um, you know, we no longer have to create, um, you know, the, the cover or height um, for canopy products. Um, it's ready to go out of the box. So, um, so what does this affect? So this affects whether canopy, the crown fire can occur in fire behavior fuel models using land fire 2016 remap data out of the box. Okay, so now they can just take that layer and, and run with it. Um, and, and then the shrub uh, nine area of the dwarf pitch pine still doesn't have canopy. We weren't quite sure if we should add that back in. That's still sort of under investigation, but we did have a nice group um, from the area that that we got together on a call and we discussed, you know, we discussed this and we discussed the fire behavior and what we should do about these um, fuel models. So how has it changed? Okay, well, <clears throat> for 2014, um, you can see the dwarf Pine Plains used to be a shrub three, which was sort of a moderate shrub load. Um, and, um, you know, the spread weight rate was a little bit lower. Now it is at uh, shrub nine. Okay, so that's a dense, <laughs> dense, uh, uh, finely branched shrubs with um, about, you know, four to six feet tall, uh, you know, so there's there's all kinds of descriptions of these shrub models, but essentially it's a very fast rate of spread. Um, and um, outside of, oh, and I also wanted to point out that, yeah, the, the Warren Grove fire area um, changed from a, a, a grass model to that shrub nine model. So a little bit more representative there. Um, so again, the rate of spread and the flame length in these fire behavior fuel models should be better represented now with remap data. And that's important because um, they're, they're doing a, uh, a huge um, effort here in the Eastern region for the Forest Service of a new wildland fire risk assessment using land fire remap data. And so our uh, risk in New Jersey and the Pinelands will be better represented with um, these improvements. So <clears throat> where is land fire headed? So we have, obviously we make improvements. We're kind of constantly looking at um, what we can do. Um, but one of the things that a lot of our users have asked for are annual releases. In the past that we've, we've done sort of biannual updates. Um, and so, you know, having sort of the latest data on the ground, especially in terms of the disturbances that happened in the last years, um, is very important in terms of fire modeling, but also for habitat. So, um, and carbon modeling. So a lot of, you know, our data is useful for that as well. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna release what we're calling the 2019 L limited update. And so <clears throat> that will be in June of 2021. And so that is gonna bring our disturbance up to speed to 2019. Um, <clears throat> so we'll have all of the, those events that are submitted and the fire program data for 2017 through 2019. And then in those disturbed areas, we use rule sets to transition the vegetation and the fuels, okay? So these are state and transition rule sets that have been used in land fire for quite some time. Um, and then uh, we're gonna go into the 2021 full update. So that'll be the year after um, the summer. Uh, and that will include also our own method of um, remote sensing and landscape change, um, which kind of pulls out more of that disturbance data. Um, but again, we'll be using some of the rule sets to um, address that change in vegetation and fuels. Um, and then after that, we're gonna really try to move towards um, a more image-based uh, updates, less uh, rule set focused. We really wanna utilize some of the advances in cloud computing and artificial intelligence to 
um, to kind of speed up our process and keep everything as current as possible. So that's kind of, you know, those are some of our goals moving forward. So what are some of the improvements we can make? Well, I, you know, my hope is that we can really gain a lot more from LIDAR. So um, I'm gonna just skip, <laughs> skip to the next one, but you can see on the right, this is, this is the kind of data you get from LIDAR. Um, so these are, this is a point cloud of uh, hits essentially. And so you can kind of see the outlines of trees there, but it is a lot of data. And so that does require um, sort of that cloud computing environment to really pull out what you need, okay, in terms of, of the structure, okay. So for vegetation height, if you look on the left, this is actual LIDAR data for every 30 meter pixel from 2015. Now remember that we kind of sample our LIDAR and model it across landscape and remap. And so we do a pretty good job. If you could, if you look at the dwarf pine plains, uh, you know, our remap data for height, it's pretty similar to the actual uh, 30 meter data that um, <clears throat> is not modeled. And so you can see that we're, we're able to pull that out. However, um, in the future um, with, with some of these processing advances, we wanna use as much of that actual LIDAR as possible and not model it across the landscape. So that's kind of one of the goals that, you know, we're thinking about working towards. Um, <clears throat> and for fuels, okay. We think about that canopy base height. Well, if you can pull that information straight from the LIDAR, um, then you're gonna get much better, um, more detailed information on structure for every uh, pixel on the landscape. And so on the left, you can see, this is from a paper that Tim Warner, Nick Skronsky and I um, put together, but you can see that, um, for, for wildfire areas, the canopy bulk density, so the amount of fuels in that mid-story is, is much higher than for prescribed fire, okay? And we're pulling this out on a meter level um, for LIDAR, using the LIDAR. Um, you know, in, in the, um, the upper canopy, prescribed fire areas have a little bit more, okay? And so, <clears throat> So just thinking about how, how we can get more and more information um, for folks uh, to use with land fire. All right, and so <laughs> how can we use this for habitat? So my friend Trish Miller, she tracks Eastern Golden Eagles. Her husband has this tracking company and, um, and these are the tracks of Eastern Golden Eagles um, on, on the East Coast. And, and uh, I think it was in 2016 where she noticed, hey, uh, there's an Eastern Golden Eagle wintering in the Pinelands. And it was the first time that that had been recorded. Um, and so her and her husband went up there and they were like, they came back to me and they said, Inga, we think they are hanging out in those prescribed fire areas. Um, and so that started this whole thing <laughs> where, um, you know, we wanted to see if that was the case, do they prefer the prescribed fire areas? Because what happens is, is that in those prescribed fire areas that are burned, you know, fairly regularly, you have sort of that high canopy base height, low shrub area. So you have this space, right? But you have cover on the top. And so the eagles, they like the cover, right? Uh, but they need a little bit of the space to see their prey. And so, that was what we were like, okay, well, is this really the case? Is this, is this what they're doing? Do they prefer this prescribed fire habitat? And <clears throat> so working with Tim Warner again and his student Leanne, um, we're, we're looking at whether that's actually uh, the case um, with the Eagle track here, um, that LIDAR information, and then um, the prescribed and wildfire history that um, I've I've been working on for many, many years. So, um, and so preliminarily, um, yes, they they are kind of preferring the areas that have less canopy bulk density in the lower, <clears throat> you know, below six, seven meters. Okay, so they and and those are the areas that um, are using prescribed fire. So 
we are finding, you know, really detailed kind of structural data that plays into those habitats ass assessments. And we're also, you know, those are also extremely useful for uh, fire behavior modeling. Um, and so just imagine having this kind of detailed structural um, information um, across the entire landscape. So um, in conclusion, <laughs> Um, I think, you know, our Landfire 2016 remap products are extremely helpful for the Pinelands, um, you know, for different habitat assessments, wildland fire risk assessments. Um, those are used nationwide. Um, we're having the 2016 remap data is being used for the east, new eastern one. Um, and we're able to improve on past versions with the Pinelands hazard and fuels, uh, fuel model adjustments. Um, the plans for land fire, we're moving towards annual updates, um, trying to move towards those, some of them using some of those technological advances um, in the future. And then also some of the potential innovations and in, in applications. So really trying to focus on that LIDAR information, pulling out more information for people um, uh, to use for habitat assessments, but also there's these next generation uh, physics-based fuel models um, that really, uh, you know, they are very structural based, right? So they're looking at heat transfer um, between different types of structure and then also the fluid dynamics um, coming through. So those are the sort of the next generation fire behavior fuel, uh, <laughs> fire behavior models that um, are kind of moving away from those, um, you know, the SH8 uh, the shrub models and things like that, and focusing more on the structure. Um, so I think that, that that LIDAR focus will really help us move into the future. Um, so we have this thing where we're like, oh, land fires, you know, it's, it's a landscape level um, uh, product. And so, you know, we tend to discourage people looking at their favorite pixel. Um, <laughs> But, you know, honestly, you know, me becoming part of this program and looking at New Jersey's um, information has, has, has been, has changed our, our mapping of that area. And I think the fuels team is, <laughs> it's like, we've never looked at New Jersey so much. And I'm like, well, you know, <laughs> that's my background. So of course I'm going to, I'm going to look at that. And that's what people tend to do, right? You look at your backyard. And so this is, um, this is just an example of, looking at my favorite pixel. So here is, um, here's some pixels in, in uh, right off of Cape May Harbor. I live in, in, in West Cape May here. We had a little 1.25 acre fire that uh, melted the houses <laughs> nearby. Um, and I wanted to see like, what's our fuel model there? And it ended up being a grass uh, one fuel model. It's sort of this Eastern cool, temperate, urban, herbaceous um, uh, vegetation class. But really what it is, is a Phragmites. And so, um, so you know, that's something that um, probably should have a more severe uh, fuel model um, because it's, it's pretty flashy when it's dry. Um, but we know that Phragmites is an issue for us, right? Because sometimes it's really wet and green and other times it's like ready to go up. So because, um, you know, we do sort of average conditions, it's a little bit of a tougher, um, uh, vegetation type for us to assign a fuel model. Um, but again, that's something that I looked at and you know, we, we know that Phragmites is an issue for us. So that's something that we're gonna try to improve in the future. But if you do look at your backyard or you know, your nearby patch that you hang out in um, and you see something off, please let us know. And there's the Landfire Help Desk there, email. That's the best way to do it. We'll track your issue. Um, and I encourage you to explore our website as well. So there's so much information there, um, anything you want. And, and, and also feel free to contact me as well. So um, just some general acknowledgements for all of our subject matter experts that I have been immersed in land fire for the past year and they have taught me so much and I just really appreciate it. I learned a lot about wildland fire risk assessments from Eva and Greg. Um, and um, LIDAR from Tim and Nick and Erica. So, uh, you know, habitat preference from Trish and 
um, you know, and all this, the folks that have helped me from the different agencies. Um, and um, so I just have to list everybody. <laughs> but, um, and there's my email there. So if you want to contact me afterwards, and I think, Joel, um, I didn't leave very much time for questions, but I'm willing to stay on after if, if need be. Um, and um, here's the, um, the number that you need to call in order for, um, to ask a question and, and the ID as well. All right. Wow, that was really neat. You know, uh, it's great to see the technology, to see how it blends with like real world conditions and how, you know, even even at the end where you look at the, the backyard and the salt marsh and the Phragmatis, yep, yeah. absolutely, they could be a problem with fire. And uh, it was really neat. I was kind of full circle for me. Years ago in another life, I worked as a forestry technician for the Forest Service out in Montana. And one of my first jobs was doing fuel surveys, which was basically on my hands and knees and like a, two meter by two meter plot right. counting the, the twigs and the shrubs. And uh, really neat to see how all that information now is at a different level and all the different applications. Um, yeah. yeah, With the, the Golden Eagle, uh, you know, that's pretty cool. Anecdotally, I think I've seen a few myself roaming around the pine lands and said, hey, cool. that looks like an eagle and it's not a bald eagle. So that's probably pretty cool. Yeah, I've heard other anecdotes as well. So that's very exciting. But that's what I was thinking the whole time is all these layers of technology, all the different applications besides fire that there mm -hmm. is absolutely a window for. Um, and it was really cool to see where there was the fire in particularly in the uh, Stafford Forge area where now the risk is down, but over time that risk is coming right back up there. So that sure. really kind of reminds you, yep, we, knew, we do need control burning because these uh, you know resources are generally just gonna get worse over time because Things are going to grow and things are going to get thicker. And without right. intervention, you know, those fuels are, are definitely accumulating. Right. Yep. Pretty neat. Yeah. So, yeah, trying, trying to prioritize where you want to manage too and, and, and using some of these resources for that, I think, is a, is a big step. Yeah. You know, especially some of the, uh, the big fires we've been seeing, like in California and out west in Colorado, and it just really drives home that you need these resources to be able to plan for those events, uh, particularly knowing the, the history of the Pinelands and, you know, that the population is close to those resources. Um, you know, we have woods all around us. <laughs> yes, we are the most densely populated state in the United States. And yet we have this, you know, highly volatile uh, fire adapted ecosystem right next yeah. to us. So, yeah, that's a that's a question I get usually with uh, talking to students and the general public, is there more fire today than in the past? Has, the, has that rate of fire changed? Um, and that, that's usually a, you know, a question you get a lot. In New Jersey, you know, we've been really effective um, at, um, at fighting wildfire. Yeah. And, um, and so, no, it's not more now. Um, and we've, we also have, you know, some of these trends of higher precipitation in the spring, which is our major fire season. And so that has also contributed, but that doesn't mean that the fall isn't getting drier, right? <laughs> so, right. so it just really depends on the timing and, you know, when all of these factors come together in terms of weather and, um, you know, and, and the different times of the season. So, um, I think I had, yeah, so here's our, our seasonal. So April being our, our big day, um, uh, our big month, I guess, for yep. fire for the past hundred years or so. Yep. Um, but then I had, um, I don't know if I want to go back, but I, I did have a slide that kind of showed, you know, how it sort of dropped off since, since 1963, really. So, yep. yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, we'll hang just for a little bit longer to see if anyone else is going to call in. Uh, you, there is a, you know, a 30 second delay. So we're always ahead of what the folks outside are, or what tuning into the broadcast are saying. Um, but that's really neat. You know, it's really great to know that uh, some of those advances in the LIDAR to actually really get an idea of the physical canopy. I mean, that that's really great because you know, you really get a much better idea of what's actually there. Um, so yeah. that probably makes yes. things even more accurate. 
Yeah, so we're definitely hoping to utilize that even more in the future. I mean, obviously we use it for our height and cover now, but you know, we sample it because it's just such a, you know, amazing amount of data. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah it's just huge. It's hard yeah. to work with, but. Uh, we do a lot of work with water in the pinelands, and I always think a little bit too about using some of that that data com combination with some of the hydrology to put them both together, like the lidar and the hy hydrology, and you can kind of see right where the terrain is and where the water table physically lies. And we do have a question. I'll bring them in. Okay. Hello, you're live on the air with your question. Thank you very much. This has uh, been a graduate level course for us this morning. I just wanted to point it out. I think it's pretty remarkable um, that the fire risk is as high as it is on top of, um, you know, uh, the largest aquifer on the northeast, um, in the northeast. So um, thank you very much. It was so educational and we're hoping to hear from you again. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And you know, you know, obviously those sandy soils really play into that, right? So they just dry out so quickly. Um, and then in the spring, um, the fuel moisture just really drops a lot um, in, our, in our pitch pine. And so combining that with the sandy soils, so that makes April our, our big month. <laughs> Before things start to green up, you know, and get in, and the live fuel moisture um, increases. Yeah, you know, the old saying is it can uh, rain in the morning and be a forest fire in the afternoon. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Yeah, but, you know, that, that, that's something to think about, you know, as climate change progresses and things change, you know, maybe our fire season may grow from April to May. Like you're saying, maybe it might include the back end. Maybe the fall is a drier time. You know, and that might be an expansion. We might end up with two fire seasons at some point in time as the, the variability changes a little bit with our daily conditions. Yeah, I did, I did look at sort of um, the early part of that fire history in the 20s and 30s, um, the seasonality compared to the later part of the fire history in the past 20 years or so. And yeah, um, obviously we're not having nearly as, as much uh, burned area, but um, it does seem to be sort of flattening out that season. Um, it's, it's, there's, there's not that huge signal in the spring uh, as there was in the 20s and 30s. Okay. All right. Well, Inga, I want to thank you. That was a, a really interesting presentation. You know, it was very technical, but what <laughs> I liked about it is uh, even like when you talked about the reflectability and the colors and, and how it showed, it's kind of like a view, view into that black box and you kind of understand mm -hmm. what's behind all that data and how that data is generated. And uh, there's certainly a need for sure. And I want to thank you for your time and to share uh, all this great information with us. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me, Joel. All right. Uh, and with that, I'm going to uh, end the broadcast. Uh, the Zoom will still be up and running and I'll talk to you in a, in a second or so. Okay. All right. See you, everybody. Uh, next week's program. We're going to have a kind of a field trip to some degree. It's going to be a tale of two pines, and it's going to be a comparison of the New Jersey Pine Barrens and the Long Island Pine Barrens, and uh, that'll be next week's program. So we'll uh, tune in, and we'll see you next Thursday. In the meantime, get outside, enjoy this good weather, and we'll see you out there. <laughs>